Well, thank you, first of all, for having me here. I've spoken twice. This will be my second speech in Bloomington. The first one was to the Young Men's Club. I'm 80 years old. I was the youngest guy there. <laughs> this is the Sunrise Club, and I haven't seen the sun yet. <laughs> and I, I want the, the absolute zero man to know that sports writers have achieved absolute zero many times, <laughs> mostly at three in the morning. I, uh, as Anna said, I've been a, actually, I, I won a journalism scholarship at the Panagraph. They paid half my tuition at Westland, worked at the newspaper for the other half. So I did that for six years, and then went to Louisville. So I've been a professional sports writer since I was 18 years old which means 62 years. So I always go back to the time at my best time at Wesleyan. I was a baseball player. I was a mediocre division three baseball player for Jack Hornberger. And I remember two things from my career as a baseball player at Wesleyan. Hornberger had a, had a shrill voice. He was always saying, Kindred, move around, you're killing the grass. <laughs> okay. And uh, at Mississippi State one time, I was nervous before a game, and I'm in one of the stalls, and I come out, coach is talking, and he says, Kendrick, flush it, you're in the big leagues now. <laughs> so I remembered that also. Um, today, again, as a professional sports writer, I've traveled a lot. I've always worried about waking up on time. I was particularly worried today because Ann first told me that this was seven o'clock. That worried me to start with because I'm kind of semi-retired and I don't need to get up, so I don't. But this time I needed to get up. Then she told me 6.45. And then yesterday she told me 6.40. So I got here today at 620. <laughs> I need to meet Ann in here. But I woke up. I went to bed at 10.30 after the football game last night. I slept for hours and hours and woke up and it was 10.55. <laughs> and then my dog woke me up at 118. And then I woke up at 2.22. And then I slept for hours and hours and hours and it was 3 o'clock. Finally woke up at 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, had the clock set for 5.20. I didn't trust it. But anyway, I made it here. I actually found, I thought Eastland, I come from, I don't know what direction that is, from 55. I thought Eastland was on the right side of the road. That's Eastland Mall, and this is on the left side of the road. And it took me a while to figure that out. And then to find the second building here. So I'm very happy to have found this place. <laughs> and I hope that I can find my way home afterwards. Maybe sunrise, maybe the sun has a room right now. I'm going to, um, I, I worked at the Panagraph for six years. My first you know, big time job was in Louisville. I was just a kid on the desk. I took my son who was three or four years old at the time with me to the office because I was, I want to be a writer. <laughs> I wasn't going to be a copy editor writing headlines on other people's stories forever. And I'm in there one day, and the, the boss, everybody was my boss at that time, says, Clay is in town, go find him. You know, give me a chance to write something. The Louisville newspaper at the time still called him Cassius Clay, although two years before that, he had changed his name to Muhammad Ali. So in Louisville, it was very easy to find Cassius Clay. I just drove drove around. Anybody seen Cassius? Everybody had seen Cassius. Because he was by then the world heavyweight champion. So I went to the west end of Louisville, uh, found him. We spent the day together. That was 1966. And I've written about him virtually every year since then. Uh, I did a book on him in... 2000, I don't know what it was now, but time 2006 maybe, called Sound and Fury. 
you all need to buy it. <laughs> you may even want to buy the, the, the book I'm really proud of. It was Leave Out the Tragic Parts, a book about my grandson who uh, was a train hopper. It's a subculture that almost nobody knows about. I certainly didn't know about it until after he had died. There's a book that I could not, not write. Uh, I spent five or six years doing that, just kind of retracing his life. But Ali is the, a man yesterday asked me, who's the best guy you ever interviewed? And the answer always is, you mean besides Ali? Because Ali was the best of all time. Uh, the greatest talker. You didn't really interview him. You just opened your notebook and listened. And if, if he saw you weren't taking notes, he would say, hey, man, write this down. This is heavy. <laughs> and he was always right. So I first interviewed him in 66. He was in exile. Then for three years, I covered him when he came back. First fight back was with Jerry Corey in Atlanta. Then Oscar Bonavina and then Frazier. The first Frazier fight, 1970 in Madison Square Garden, was uh, the greatest sports event that I've ever been to, or ever will be to. Um, seeing that everyone there was wearing ermine and mink and purple shoes, and those were the men. <laughs> it was Frank Sinatra was at ringside shooting pictures. I was at ringside taking notes. Ali was undefeated. Frazier was undefeated. Fight of the century. I remember Ali. I was at ringside. Ali's corner's over this way. I'm at ringside here. Ali is leaning back against the ropes, leaning away from Frazier, thing he always did. And Frazier, meanwhile, was, was just it was hitting him. It scared me, just the sound uh, so close. And Ali was looking down and he, he looked at me. I don't think he ever really knew who I was other than I was his Louisville guy. I was around all the time. But he's looking at me and he's saying, no contest. Meanwhile, he's getting this, you know, the whatever beat out of him. But it's no contest. Uh, he lost that fight, uh, came back later. I covered 17 of his fights. I didn't go to, Man to Manila or Zaire because the newspaper at that time was too cheap to send me. At, you know, had that happened later in my career, I would have thrown a fit or thrown an editor out a window, something like that. <laughs> but at that time, I was you know, too uh, subservient to do that. So I was with Ali in every situation imaginable because everything happened with Ali. I was in a car with him at Deer Lake one time. He's training for the Foreman fight, 1974, Deer Lake, Pennsylvania, uh, in a Cadillac. He's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. We're going maybe, I was afraid to look at the speedometer. Last time I looked at it, it was like 75, 80. And we're going down this rutted logging road through trees that are like on either side of us. And at some point in there, I thought it was a good thing to ask him, do you ever think of dying? <laughs> because I was thinking of it at that point in time. And he, he gave me a long sermon while he's driving with one hand. He's you know, talking to me about you know, service to man is the rent we pay for our time on earth and all this. And I was just happy to get where we were going. Um, I've interviewed him in the shower. Red in rings at Miami Beach, interviewed him in bed one time. I told a friend of mine that eventually I'm going to write a book about Ali because I was in bed with Ali. And my friend Dave Anderson from the New York Times said, we all were. I said, no, no, I mean, I was in bed with Ali. And, and that happened in Las Vegas. Usually what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But... It was a crowded, Ali was the most accessible of celebrities of all time. He wanted everybody with him all the time. So his hotel room was packed. <coughs> bedroom over there, bedroom over here, center hall, everybody was there. I see him, he's in bed. He sees me, and I try to ask him a question, but he can't hear me. So he says, Louisville, 
I don't think he ever knew my name, but he knew the words. <laughs> Boy, Bill, come in here. So I come in, and I still can't hear him. I want to do a column about his entourage, the people with him, their names, who they are. And I'm trying to talk to him, and he says, he raises the corner of the sheet and says, get in. So, I don't know what you do if the heavyweight champion of the world says, get in, but I did. <laughs> and one of us was wearing clothes. <laughs> so we, we pull the sheets up over our head like a couple of kids hiding from their parents. And I do this interview, and he takes my notebook and just holds it above his head, and he's writing the names of the people and how much he pays them every week. Uh, and then I talked to him about whatever fight it was for a little bit, and I leave. And that was just kind of normal behavior <laughs> because anything could happen at any time with him. Um, I last saw him, you know, I, I quit going to fights actually um, because I just finally realized what was happening. Finally realized what was happening. I mean, we, we read now and we've seen about football players being you know, CTE, chronic something, and stuff, whatever. Uh, CTE, brain damage. Football players who have worn helmets their entire life. Muhammad Ali was hit in the head a million times. Not much of an exaggeration. You know, I've always said the two greatest fighters of all time were Cassius Clay and Muhammad Ali. Because when he was Cassius Clay, he was young and strong and fast, and you couldn't hit him. When he was Muhammad Ali, he had lost speed. He was heavier, older, and we all know how that is. When you get heavier and older, you're no longer the, the uh, butterfly that we used to be. So he took a lot of damage as, a, as an older fighter. And I saw that happening. And it, it really made me sad because uh, Ali was the greatest athlete that I'd ever seen, greatest athlete I will ever see. At his best, he was 6'3", 210. Vince Lombardi said he would have been the greatest tight end in history. He was a great athlete. I saw him at Madison Square Garden one time warming up. Uh, the Knicks were warming up. And Ali took a basketball at half court and just went just like this through it and it actually went in. He'd never been a basketball player. It was just hand-eye coordination. He got lucky. But it was still evidence of this uh, different person that he was. Um, he went from reviled to revered. I saw both those things I saw happen. You know, I always thought that he was a puppet when he was reviled. And the whole nation of Islam thing, you know, I thought that he had been not brainwashed, but he had been young and just liked the attention. The, the nation, Islam, the nation was not the true Islam. When Elijah Muhammad, who'd been, you talk about absolute zero boring people, nation of Islam talk will bore people. But it's important in the sense that he was a different person. When Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the nation, died, then Ali felt safe, literally safe. What happened, he, he one time told me in 1974, I couldn't leave the nation because they would do to me what they did to Malcolm X. And what they did to Malcolm X was got him down in public. And Ali was afraid of that. Um, and I think that's... Once Elijah Muhammad died, Ali became the person that I thought that he always was, was just a sweetheart guy. He just wanted to be liked. And then and the last time I saw him really in public was 96 at the Atlanta Olympics. Um, when he was lighting the torch for the Olympics. I think probably most of you have seen that. He's shaking like this. Because uh, the, the, they say he had Parkinson's, I think it was just brain damage all the time. Whether the brain damage leads to Parkinson's or not, I don't know. But I know that he was hit in the head too many times. 
I thought he was going to set himself on fire. Everybody else was just astonished and, and, and amazed and happy to see him there. Uh, I was afraid for him. I'm glad that he got through it. The next morning, I was actually with him. A friend of mine, Jerry Eisenberg, from the Newark Star-Ledger, and I went to see Ali in his hotel room the next morning. And, you know, one of the most, everything was remarkable about Ali. When I talked to him that morning, I couldn't understand him. He couldn't talk. Um, he was laying on a bed. I sat on the edge of the bed. It felt like I was in a rowboat. It was just, he was, his whole body was trembling. Um, and he was going to, he's, he gave me a Bible and gave Eisenberg a Bible and had a couple pieces of paper that we were supposed to read Bible verses from because his sermon to us that day, he thought he was still, he, at that time he was 45 years old, but he was trying to be, in his mind, a preacher of Islam. And he was teaching us that the Bible had 30,000 contradictions. It's one of the tenets of the nation, actually, uh, preached that. 30,000. So he had me read a Bible verse. Then he would have Eisenberg read a Bible verse that contradicted it. And we did this back and forth for like six or seven times until I said to Eisenberg, you think we're going to do all 30,000? <laughs> Probably would have, except he went to sleep. Uh, so I, and then the, literally the last time I saw him, so the first time I saw him was 66 with my, with my son. The last time I saw him was probably 2006. I went to his farm in Berrien Springs, Michigan. And then uh, he, could, he couldn't talk, you know, would fall asleep. He wanted to, I, I wanted to see his, he had built a separate building uh, for a gym, a state-of-the-art boxing gym. I wanted to see it. So he was taking me over there, and then he couldn't walk. He, you, I was, I'm very familiar with Parkinson's, what Parkinson's looked like. My wife's father had Parkinson's, you know, where his feet would get stuck, start to walk, and his feet would get stuck, and he kind of lean, topple forward. So I had to hold Ali's elbow to help him walk the 40 feet to his gym. And I'm thinking, this is so sad. You know, the greatest athlete that I've ever seen, now he's 55 years old and can't move. And I'm helping him. Um, but all of that is in this book that I did uh, because I thought that I had seen Ali in a way that, that other people had never seen him. Uh, so I'm proud of that book, proud of the book on my grandson. Um, and what I'm doing now, 10 years, the last 10 years, I've been writing about the Morton High School girls basketball team. Probably written, other than Ali, I've written more about the girls basketball team than any subject of all time. 500,000 words probably in 11 years. They won. I, I started going not because they were any good. I didn't know if they were any good or not. Just a friend's daughter was playing. So I, I went and being uh, a sports writer uh, forever, I had actually never been, I have still never been to an event that I paid to see. You know, it was, people paid me to do who what they pay to do. So it's been a charmed life. I started going to the games. I couldn't sit there and not want to write something about it. So I found a guy that did a website on the girls. He was later quoted, this guy, he was later quoted by ESPN about how I came to do that. He said this disheveled old man came out of the future. <laughs> I was saying, maybe I need a haircut or something. Um, so I've done that. The team became good. I mean, they were pretty good. I didn't realize. I didn't know how good they were. I've never seen a girls basketball team in my life. You know, it turns out that they were very good. They won four state championships in the last six years. 
lost two years ago on the last shot of that, or you know, that have had a 38 and 0 state championship season. Uh, so that's been fun. And now I'm, I'm trying to write a book that allegedly is about my career. Uh, but every time I think of that, I can't, uh, I don't even know where to start or who cares. You know, it's kind of like <laughs> write 300 pages about an absolute zero. You know, nobody cares. <laughs> so I can't persuade myself that it matters. Uh, I'd much rather write about the, the girls uh, uh, becoming women. It's, it's a great, it's just, just great fun, you know. The fellow who's got his eighth grandchild, you know, I've, I've got four, never had a, a daughter, never had a, a, a girl, grand, grand, never had a granddaughter. And so all these girls are just, I just like to watch them grow up and see the changes in them. It's amazing. Um, Lan, yeah. have I talked too long? Well, not long enough. I can take questions. Anybody wants to ask a question? Um, I, I saw the 60 minute interview. Yeah, I, I, meant to, I meant to say something about that because Ken Burns did the, the well, this is another topic. We'll get to 60 minutes. But the Ken Burns thing on Ali was eight hours. I was one of the talking heads in it, and it was very good. And eight hours is not, it's just the beginning of time to talk about Ali. So what I've done today is give you the Cliff's Notes version of the Cliff's Notes version of the Cliff's Notes version of Ali. So what about 60 minutes? Well, I was just wondering, one, how it was to be interviewed instead of interviewing. It was, it was uncomfortable. <laughs> before, you, before you fully answer that, a book about your life matters. <coughs> well, uh, um, I am doing that. I'm doing, my wife died four months ago. She was at the nursing home in more than uh, five and a half years. And so I, I'm, and she was, and that's why I say I've never paid to go to the game. You know, I, I've gone to at least 2,000 basketball games from my time, Central Catholic, Bloomington High School, normal community, you know, all of that. That's where I, that's all I did for six years here. And then after that, basketball was the thing that, baseball I understand better than anything. Basketball was second. So I've been to a couple thousand basketball games, but my wife had never gone with me to a basketball game because we had this like division of duties. I was the sports writer, you know, she was the world champion <laughs> at everything. Uh, so, she started, going. she started going to get all these girls games with me. So it was always fun. And that's the reason I'm trying to write this book, just to be able to tell her story. The 60 minutes thing was fun. It was fun. You know, they talked to me for maybe three hours, you know, and got maybe 30 seconds of usable material. <laughs> The Warham girls over there are my cousins. I didn't realize they got rings. I'm sorry? Uh, the Warham girls over there are, are my cousins. Oh, and they're so great. I love them. It wasn't until the 60 Minutes thing I, I realized they got rings for the state championship. Yeah, four of them. Got four of them. They're beautiful. The, the state pays. I think school is, is obligated to create that for them. Yeah, Jadison and JC. I love them. Dad Jasson is the best. I can't hear you. Is there a particular game that you remember covering that you that you Basketball. forgot you were reporting on and just became absorbed into it? Or were you always able to keep that distinction of I'm here as a reporter? Well, it was it was, it was different with the girls, with with the Morton girls. It was it was I wrote it, I approached it a little differently. You know, first of all, they're high, it's high school. You know, second, whether it matters or not, they're girls. You know, I like the girls' basketball much better than the boys' basketball, first of all. 
I get tired. I get, I've seen too many guys going around puffing puff their chest. The, the, uh, the coach, the girls' coach, Bob Becker, says the difference between boys and girls, this is high school basketball, is that if a boy makes one out of 20 shots, he thinks he's Michael Jordan. He's going to keep shooting 20 shots because he made that one last week. Whereas if a girl makes 19 out of 20, she's going to want to be in the gym the next day to figure out why she missed that one. And I think that's true. It's, a, it's an exaggeration, but it's true enough. You know, the girls are selfless. The boys are selfish. More often than not. So it's much more fun to watch the girls. And I wrote about them in, in a different way. You know, I didn't write about it. I had trouble in the mid Illini conference. Spent, I don't know if anybody would be here who ever went through East Peoria or been to East Peoria or, heaven forbid, actually lives in East Peoria. <laughs> but the East Peoria people really dislike me because I'm always. Yeah, I don't say anything critical about the Morton players ever, never in 500,000 words have I been second guessing or critical of anything they've ever done. And they've done things that they should be criticized for, but I just ignore them. Whereas being a professional sports writer, I would not ignore that in almost every situation, but this is a little, it's just different. Um, but East Peoria, in one game, committed a dozen intentional fouls against Morton. I held that against them for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I would always refer to East Peoria as poor, poor East Peoria. <laughs> and I like the alliteration of that. They didn't like that. Um, but that's the only time that I've that I've strayed into criticism. There is much more, uh, I try to find something. I believe one of my tenets as a sports writer is if you're paying attention, if you really pay attention, you're gonna see something in every game that you've never seen before. Every game. And I, and then write about that. And that's what I do. At the girls games, always, I mean, really, if you're paying attention, you'll see something you've never seen, you know, and or you've forgotten you saw it 30 years ago. Like, I'd never seen a father come down to the Chicago Bulls and carry Michael Jordan off the floor. But I've seen that at Morton Girls. Father came out of the bleachers, picked up his daughter, and carried her to the training room. So I wrote about that. Just find something different to write about all the time. Don't the Lady Potters pay you in candy? I'm sorry? Don't the Lady Potters pay you in candy? I am a, still a paid professional sports writer. <laughs> <laughs> I told the guy, the, the webmaster one time, this is after four or five years of writing, I was just joking. You know, look, I'm a professional sports writer. I should be paid something for doing this because he was putting it on the website all the time, not making any money, but I was just joking. And I said that, you know, he looked at me and he judged my experience and my talent and my good looks. And he said, how about a box of milk does every day? <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> so the last seven or eight years, I've I've been paid with a box of milk goods every game. Some, sometimes the girl, the, one of the players will bring it to me. Sometimes the coach will, will have it. But I once figured out that I had like 35,000 calories of milk goods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.